This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid off somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. Good evening. My name is Mark Sine. <clears throat> I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our PM services for Sunday, September the 25th. Per usual, we will sing several songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and I will have a short message for you that I hope will be uh, enlightening and uplifting. Uh, we are so singing from our songbook that we use at the Northfield Church. It's called Songs of Faith and Praise. If you do not have that book, uh, I will give you not just the number, but I'll give you the name of the song so you will have time to uh, find it, a uh, second or two, and sing along with us. So we will start with a hymn entitled Father of Mercies. Father of Mercies, in our book, it is number 51, 51, Father of Mercies. <clears throat> Father of Mercies, day by day, my love for thee grows more and more. Thy gifts are strewn upon my way Like sands upon the great seashore Like sands upon the great seashore Father of mercies, God of love, whose gentle gifts all creatures share, the rolling seasons as they move, proclaim to all thy constant care, proclaim to all thy constant care. Father of mercies, may our hearts ne'er overlook thy bounteous care. But what our Father's hand imparts still own in grateful praise and prayer, still own in grateful praise and prayer. And let's turn to number 71, that is entitled, As the Deer, 71, <clears throat> As the Deer. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength and shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want 
loved you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. And to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we are going to sing A Common Love. A Common Love. That's number 705 in our book, 705, A Common Love. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy. In the truth of God's word. Each Lord's Day, we are instructed to um, observe the Supper of the Lord. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it says they did gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. Jesus instituted this on the night he was betrayed. The Apostle Paul in almost the same words in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, um, placed it before the Corinthian church and for you and I, uh, what we are to do on the first day of the week. It is a, uh, it is a time of remembrance. Uh, it is a time where we remember your divine plan in that yet while we were still sinners, you sent Jesus to us. You sent him to walk among men. You sent him to feel the pain of humans, uh, to feel the emotions, to even uh, be tempted as he was by Satan. Uh, and we, uh, we, we gather together to encapsulate that life, but moreover, to encapsulate the sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us, that he died on the cross, that he gave himself up, a one-time sacrifice for each of us so that uh, our sins can be forgiven, so that grace would fall upon us, and that through that sacrifice that we would have the opportunity for salvation to live with you forever. And so we have these symbols of his body and his blood, the bread for his body and the fruit of the vine, this grape juice for uh, his blood. Let's give thanks for his body, the bread. We are in awe, dear Heavenly Father, that your plan was so wonderful and Jesus carried it out perfectly, that he went to the cross, though innocent of any wrongdoing, that he died, that he gave up his body, that uh, uh, each of us might uh, come to understand uh, how great a God we have and what a wonderful Savior that Jesus was. Bless us as we partake of the symbol of his broken body. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. When God was about to free uh, the Israelites from Egyptian bondage after the plagues, the last plague was the death 
of the firstborn. The Israelites were told to put blood on the portals uh, of their homes, and those that had the blood on the portals would have the angel of death pass over their house. Um, Jesus enacted that on the cross, that uh, through his blood that the that the death will pass over us, that eternal death, and that we might have life anew one day with you. Uh, it is uh, through that blood that we have the forgiveness of our sins, that grace will come upon us. And it's so wonderful that Jesus was willing to shed that blood for us. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood, that indeed, just as in the time of the Israelites and the Egyptians, that the angel of death will pass over us, and we will, through the blood of Jesus, have our sins forgiven, have grace fall upon us, and have the opportunity to live with you forever. Help us to appreciate that sacrifice and that shed blood. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. As a matter of convenience at this time, we do something else that we are told to do on the first day of the week. And that is that we are to lay by in store, that we are to take collection. Uh, and in those days, the collection mostly was given to the apostles. Uh, very often, uh, those monies were dispersed so that people will, would be helped who were in need so that the word would be able to spread. That same thing is uh, is there for us today as we give back to the Lord so that those in need might be helped, but especially that those that need to come to the Lord will see that through your living church, your kingdom here on earth, that um, we have uh, that ability that can only happen when we give back what is your own. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have blessed us so richly. We just pray that uh, uh, each and every week, uh, each and every month, each and every year, that you will be, a, uh, your church will be an integral part of our lives to the extent that we're willing to give of uh, uh, our means so that it can function the way it's supposed to function. Bless us in our giving. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song we're going to sing is number 422, Spirit of the Living God. 422, Spirit of the Living God. It's a short song. Let's sing it through twice. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me. Oh, 
on me. Thank you all for singing along with us. Uh, I know I was uplifted. I know that the Lord was praised and uh, that's the uh, reason that we sing to him. Uh, this evening, I have a message for you that I, I hope will be part one of a two-part series about the Holy Spirit. Okay, and if you were there this morning, uh, you heard uh, what uh, this message was to be all about, the person or the personage of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, this begs to question, uh, is the Holy Spirit a person or is it just a force or a power of God? And I hope that we will at least partially answer that. I think we'll totally answer it. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit as part of the Godhead. There are religious organizations out there today that believe that the Holy Spirit is not a person, uh, not a person like the other two persons of the Godhead, Jesus and God. Let me give you an example. And usually I don't like to uh, mention other church organizations, but this one really it goes far afield. The Jehovah's Witnesses have their own Bible. Uh, the Bible is called the New World Translation. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, now this is the Jehovah Witnesses Bible, the New World Translation. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth proved to be formless and waste, and there was darkness upon the surface of the watery deep. Now, up to there, it's okay. But here's the part. Here's the part that differs from uh, the, the true translation of God's word. It says, and God's active force was moving to and fro over the surface of the waters. They call what is the Holy Spirit God's active force. So instead of the Holy Spirit being a person, it was a force. Other translations of the Bible take it all the way down to there, and it said, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the water. The Spirit moved on the face of the water. So let's start here. And there are many misconceptions out there, and sometimes we slip. I've slipped before, I know. Since we look at the Holy Spirit, that pneumos thing, air and so forth, uh, we tend to look at the Spirit and, and we call it an it. Right? Not a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not just an influence. It's not just some vague force. It's not like fog. It's not like electricity. It's not like the wind. It's not like the sunshine. The, the Holy Spirit is not merely a mode. The Holy Spirit is not merely an aspect. Neither is the Holy Spirit a mind a temper or disposition of God or Christ. So let's get all of those things out of the way. I've just told you all of the things that the Holy Spirit is not. The Holy Spirit is not something synonymous with the Bible or the Word of God. Now, there are many things which both are, we are both said to do but this does not make them the same, all right? Doesn't make them the same. There's a difference between the Spirit and what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Spirit is not a sword. It's synonymous, but it doesn't mean the same thing. The Spirit is not something that cuts through us like a sword. It is not an influence. 
It is real. It is a person. Now, sometimes, and here's where it gets a little weird. Sometimes because the King James Version uses the word ghost and the Holy Ghost, our, our minds get Halloween-y. You know, uh, the spooky things, the, the ghosts, like the ghosts that appear around the season of Halloween. This is not the Holy Spirit. Now, there are, and maybe, many other reasons that cause people to not realize that the Holy Spirit is a person, just like God and Jesus are persons. By saying that the Holy Spirit and Jesus uh, are part of the Godhead and are persons, it does not mean that they are persons as human beings. All right. The Holy Spirit is not a human being. God is not a human being. Jesus took on the form of a human being for a period of time. So uh, we can't equate those to those concrete things. God's not concrete, nor is the Holy Spirit. But make no mistake, like Jesus, like God, the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, where is the evidence? You know, we always look for that, don't we? We always look for the evidence. First, in our Bibles, it uses a masculine pronoun to describe the Holy Spirit when speaking of the Holy Spirit. Here's what Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, ready, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. He said to his disciples, in, in essence, when they became apostles, the Holy Spirit, this wonderful, active, real personage of the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were able to do things that they could never, ever, ever have done before. They were able to understand things that they could never, ever understand before. Remember, Jesus' teachings, though not complex, uh, were difficult for the disciples to understand. And he told them that, uh, I get it. You don't get it. Even when Jesus said he would die, they didn't get it. When he said he would uh, uh, raise from the dead, they didn't get it. But what he did say was, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And so, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles, all things were brought into remembrance. A second proof that the Holy Spirit is a person is that he is capable of speaking. John sixteen thirteen. But when he, get this, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will speak on his own initiative. I'm sorry. For he will not speak on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And so the Holy Spirit hears, making him animate, not inanimate, not a ghost, not a fog, real. And then he spoke to the apostles. The primary job of the Holy Spirit was to guide the apostles and the prophets in recording the word of God. That's why we call this book, our Bible, the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God. 
that the Holy Spirit was in the hands of those that wrote these words. Hence, they are Holy Spirit inspired. Now, here's another thing that many folks don't get. And I want us to get this. After our Bible was written, the Spirit no longer talks to people like it talked to people in the first century, like it talked, it talked to the apostles. It's interesting to note that even in the first century, the Holy Spirit did not speak to people only to the apostles, only to those that he chose to speak to. He always spoke to one of the prophets. He always spoke to one of the apostles. For example, in Acts the eighth chapter, we have the story unfolded about the Ethiopian treasurer, the Ethiopian eunuch. All right. When Philip followed the instructions of an angel and he arrived at that road that went from Jerusalem to Gaza, he found this man from Ethiopia. Here's what it said. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Look it up. It's not Simon talking. It's the Bible talking. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join the chariot. The Spirit said this to Philip in terms that he could understand so that he could go and join the chariot. Now, why didn't the Spirit speak directly to the Ethiopian? It didn't work that way. It didn't work that way then. It didn't work that way today. Do you know how the Spirit talks to us today? It talks to us through God's Word. The Holy Spirit inspired word. Now, it was never God's plan. Even in the days when the Spirit did speak to people, God's plan was for men and women to teach other people. If you have your pens or pencils out real quick, Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 14. These are proofs to us. Maybe, maybe I should, you know, just to make sure that we understand, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For since the wisdom of God, the world through his wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. 1 Corinthians 1, 21 and Romans 10, 14. How then? Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Do you get that? People were to be the agents for teaching one another. Okay? Not the Holy Spirit. We have it through God's Holy Spirit inspired word but not the Holy Spirit physically talking to us. Third, another proof that the Holy Spirit is a person is that he can be grieved. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Inanimate objects, fogs, mists cannot be grieved. The Holy Spirit was grieved 
The Holy Spirit has all the emotions that you and I have because the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, what I've tried to get across this evening is that the Holy Spirit is a person and not just some force of God. Let's not make that mistake. He has been active from the very beginning. The Spirit of God moved on the face of the water. The Holy Spirit in person was there with Jesus and with God at the creation. He's been active from the creation. And hopefully next week, uh, I will show that he is also part of the Godhead. And therefore, he is also a part of God. I hope that this message uh, uh, did a little to inform you. Maybe you knew all these things. It's okay to bring into remembrance things that we knew. No, it's called reinforcement. It's part of the teaching and learning process. And if you did learn some new things, that's wonderful. And we will grow by knowing those things. You know, it is important for us uh, because uh, it is important in God's plan that uh, we become uh, children of God, that we, through his Holy Spirit-inspired word, and that's where we get the instructions on how to become a child of God, in that it's not enough to read, it's not enough to hear, it's not even enough to believe. It is to take that hearing into obedience. That obedience means that we confess Jesus as the Son of God, we repent of our former lives, and we are baptized for the remission of our sins. And then it said in Acts chapter 238, and we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that spirit that dwells within us. If you have not taken that step, we extend the invitation to you this evening. If you need to come to the Lord, please get in touch with one of us. We will be at your beck and call. Let's end this service with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your wonderful plan. We're grateful for having the Holy Spirit inspired word. We're, we're grateful that the Holy Spirit spoke to the prophets and spoke to the apostles and guided the writers of our Bible to write the truths that you have laid out for us. Bless us as we come to understand the, the whole idea of the Godhead, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Continue to bless us this evening. Continue to uh, be with us. Help us as we retire for the evening to uh, go to you in prayer and have you on our hearts and have you on our hearts as we wake up in the morning so that we can be your servants as you would want us to be. Continue to be with us. Continue to bless us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid off somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from